Okay, my name is Ed Teha. I'm here with Adam Kokesh. We're going to be talking about some issues about politics. Um, I want to make a full disclosure, though. Adam wrote the introduction, the foreword for the book that Jay Lee Porter and I wrote uh, called Crypto Shrug. And Adam is a good read. I, I, I happily endorse it. I, actually, it's, there, there aren't very many books that I've actually uh, gotten all the way through in the, in the last few years. And, and as long as that, it's a, it's a, it's a page turner. Yeah, right. Appreciate that. It is something that's near and dear to your heart, I know. <laughs> and Adam is the author of Freedom. Um, and well, I just got I got to put this in perspective. First of all, I, it's funny because we're sitting here like like we're we're smart, like we're we're a couple of authors, but that's not exactly accurate. How how many books have you written, Ed? Oh, 10, 20? 10, 20, like, and, and this, this, now this is, this is totally different than my book. This is, this is a fun read. This is like, this is, this is, it's, it's informative and it's, it's challenging a little intellectually to some people, but it's, it's a fun read. It's, it, I mean, you'd agree, like that's yeah. what it is first and foremost, like, right. And it's, it's a story. Uh, yeah. And it's, uh, 340 something pages, right. And, and he's written 10 to 10 to 20 of these. And and I wrote a pamphlet. All right, this thing's a hundred pages, and it's a totally different concept. I'll let Ed sell it, but just just to put this in perspective here, like I I, I was uh, I, I was voted in high school uh, least likely to ever finish reading a book, and then I wrote one sort of. So Ed, Ed. well, see there you go. <laughs> that that said, America shows you that anybody can accomplish things in this world. <laughs> but writing a book like this, that's very much, it's very dense. It's full of ideas. It's more Tom Paine than it is. Oh, and Rand. yeah, well, they do, but and, and I, I didn't even come up with any of the ideas in here. I ripped them all off. That's that. That's actually the point of the book. It's a, a, a libertarian uh, primer. It's the uh, condensed works of Rothbard and Rand and and Hayek and Mises and Spooner and uh, Rose and Molyneux and and I could I could just uh uh Ruert. there's a lot of r's in there um <laughs> i used to uh conkin i used to have a list of like 20 names i could just rattle off and it was uh all these books that i got when i was in jail in dc for civil disobedience and i decided that uh there were a lot of people who had tried to write these books that are conversion tools that are you know to to alter someone's worldview mm -hmm. And so I decided that I would be the best ripoff artist in the freedom movement and take all their best features and none of their worst and add a little sort of modern update, uh, you know, of, of other influences of mine, uh, uh, of people who look at the intersections of, of technology and freedom and, and where we're going with this in ways that uh, a lot of those authors that I mentioned uh, just didn't live to have a chance to really right. see. And, and now we're in this... We live in this incredible time right now. Uh, I describe it in the book as the asymptote of the human experience of things just accelerating to this point at which, you know, I know exponential curves never go vertical, but, you know, from the perspective of our puny human brains to look up and be like, holy crap, you well, know. Let's address that for a moment. You, you talk about that in terms of uh, two arcs in the history of government. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> the first one, technology, which is actually production efficiency of any kind, right? It doesn't matter. It used to be machines. Today, it's it tends to be things in the internet. I like that definition. Product technology are, is the, the mechanism of production efficiency. Right. Yeah. And that's what we were dealing with, too, that Ann Rand talked about the means of production. And today, the means of production aren't machine presses and, and Bessemer furnaces so much. They still are to some extent. But the real drivers these days tend to be technological tend to be chips information and based. information. Yeah. Right. And uh, so you say that the, the first arc in the history of government is that this production efficiency increases the tolerance of theft. Now, that makes perfect sense. If you've got plenty and yeah. somebody rips you off for a little bit, you're less you concerned than if you're subsistence. Yep, exactly. So that's unarguable, I would say. The second one, you postulate... An increasing awareness that we deserve to live without being robbed. Okay, so if we, 
if we are more tolerant of being robbed, wouldn't that diminish our sensitivity to it or our awareness of it? Well, okay, so in that sense, and I'm, I'm glad you ask it that way, and, and maybe in, in, the next, in the next edition of the book I'll have to tweak the language a little. Um, but no, I, I, I think of the awareness and the tolerance here as two totally separate concepts. That uh, tolerance is, is that, like you described, material ability to survive while being robbed from mm -hmm. uh whereas the awareness is the understanding that it doesn't have to be this way okay so it's not an awareness um that we deserve to live without being robbed so much as in a, more of an awareness that we are well I, I, well okay so now you're getting to the point that government is able to rob from a lot of people without them really being aware of it. I don't buy that. I, I, I understand that, I, I, that analysis, and I, I, I agree with the core point of that, which is that uh, people are propagandized into complacency <clears throat> with being uh, robbed from, you know, by government mm -hmm. uh, because taxation is, is theft. But um, I, I think they've always, I think, you know, within that, people have always known, like, there's, I think, I, I don't want to, like, deny that. I, I think it's, when I say awareness, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to get into this a little bit more, because it's, it's, it's connected to me with a very optimistic vision, which to me is a, a very realistic, very science-based vision of the progress of what a lot of people would call human nature. And, and it's that, we get more ethical over time, we get more moral over time, we get more capable over time, and those things are connected. And the real important underpinning of this that I use more than anything else to back it up, uh, is someone who, who disagrees with us, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, ideologically, and it's Professor Steven Pinker at Harvard, uh, who did a great TED talk about this, and has written a number of books about the decline in human violence. And I highly recommend the TED Talk. You know, obviously it's like, what, 15, 20 minutes. And, mm -hmm. and he, he really makes this case uh, from, from data and, and scientific observation irrefutably that the likelihood uh, of you suffering violence at the hands of another human being is lower today than it ever has been. Okay. And the, 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 this, is, this is a, a sort of decay curve uh, decline. And that, you know... The, the idea of, of life being nasty, brutish, and short is, is, is really uh, true, but it's one that changes for the better over time. Uh, if, especially if you look at the bigger statistics, at death uh, by violence and you look mm -hmm. at warfare. Uh, as, as much as we are deceived by the mainstream media, you know, if it bleeds, it leads to think that the world is full of conflict and everybody in the Middle East hates us and wants us dead and, you know, war, 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 you know, and, and even that's kind of like... We used to, like, I remember talking about that like 10 years ago, you know, when I started my activism already after the invasion of Iraq, when it was already settled, mm -hmm. well settled under the occupation at that point. And, uh, it, but you just step back and go statistically, wow, insignificant compared to war of the past. And even if you go past World War II, it's not that there were bigger wars, but that violent conflict was just far more pervasive. Mm -hmm. And that murder, like just, now we could hate on the state all day, but the fact that the state has taken a monopoly on certain services doesn't mean those services are bad. Right. The service of public safety and accountability for murder, holding murderers accountable, mm -hmm. is a really important public service, you know? And I, it, it should be a community-based one. It can be a market-supported one. It doesn't have to be by government, obviously, but, you know, government, after having taken over a monopoly of those services, does deserve credit for, wow, murder rates have gone just way down over time. I think that's more societal. I think government is just the manifestation and a bad, ugly one and, and, and an inefficient one, but the, it's a manifestation of this great arc of human progress that is away from violence. And away from violence means to greater cooperation. What makes us the dominant species, aside from our intellect, how we apply it is that we're the most cooperative species 
on Earth. I mean, except you know, for you bees, can, you're gonna argue different things. There are plenty. <laughs> yes, there are plenty. But no. But even then, if you look at the complexity of, of human interaction, right. you look at the complexity of human communication, you look at the technology that we've been able to produce. And, and maybe there are ants like that live 15 feet underground that have complex societies that we just have no idea about. Like, I don't mean to be, you know, species <laughs> arrogant here. You know, I'm sure there are aliens, of course, with, with way better technology that are uh, making their way here as we speak. But um, no, we, we could be the first ones in, in the universe, too. That's also a possibility. Of course. But this this uh, this trend of human progress to me is I, I see it as connected to deeper trends of nature deeper forces of nature well along that line you also talk about the uh growing demand for self-government um and okay you say that and you mention it several times in your book i don't know where you're getting that from can you give me some examples it seems to me that what i see most of the time is a demand for more government from people they there's a, the there's a demand for more stuff. There's a demand for better quality of life because we see, as a species, we look around and we see the inequality. We see what we're capable of. We see what the super class has. And we go, why are we struggling here? Isn't, isn't this part of our share of, of the wealth of humanity? And, and to a certain degree, that's absolutely true because a lot of the concentrations of wealth and power exist based on government sponsored injustice or mm -hmm. you could say maybe not government sponsored but uh violently carried out by government i mean that's 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 how uh all of this happens so the way that i see this manifest aside from the growing size just one person at a time of the freedom movement of the libertarian voluntary specific and anarch anarcho-capitalist you know philosophical awareness movement is a trend towards localization. And this is very important in the book mm -hmm. uh, about how we move forward because we really don't want to pull the rug out from underneath anyone. Uh, I think as, as uh, if I could push the red button and say, end all government today, yes, of course I would do it. And I know that it would be for the better, but there's a better way than, than that. That, that and, and, and if, you, if you just did that, there, there would be uh, a certain power vacuum Mm -hmm. If there wasn't the awareness going with that, if we didn't change the public paradigm and you just got rid of government, people go, well, uh oh, we need a government. You know, well, that, that's the issue some people take with your uh, executive order idea that if you were elected. Well, well, no, that but the point of that is that the states would have you'd still have whatever you want at the state level. We're not arguing. That. Right. And that's why localization a... unites. Well, hold on. Let me, let me get okay. back to the idea of where I see this, because this is this is really important, too, is, is even background before we get to. Uh, applying this politically in the United States of, of localization is that w we see this throughout the world. You see the Brexit movement, mm -hmm. you see the Scottish independence movement, in Catalonia, mm -hmm. in Spain, uh, throughout the world and lots of places that Americans are totally ignorant of the news. <laughs> there are lots of other similar movements uh, in but the I'm United more States. Nationalistic. They're localistic. They want their control for them and their community okay. rather than being forced into a bigger collective. And that represents a huge shift away from globalization of government, collectivization, trying to be, and, and what it represents, a, a major shift away from especially, most importantly, really fundamentally in the nature of government, is national militarism, which, which, which is a trend towards we want the biggest club. Mm -hmm. We want the biggest team. We want the most guns, right. tanks, bombs, soldiers. We want to be the superpower, Russia, the United States. China. By the way, the Russia-U.S. thing, you know that the Russian economy is, depending on how you measure it, 1 30th to 1 40th the size of the United States. To try to say like Russian in the United... like Russia is, a, is more accurately described as a satellite of the American empire. Than, than, than an opposing superpower. Because it's the same string pullers behind most global, right. major governments in the world. And the big string, the, the, the way, 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 way bigger strings are on the American government, not the Russian government. But in the United States, Vermont, New Hampshire, Texas, Colorado, the 51st State Project in Colorado, uh, the California now, California, California, <laughs> the independence movement in California, you know, uh, also the, the move to split California up into six states. 
uh, the state of Jefferson. Or three or two. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, well, I, think, uh, I think on the ballot this year it's three, right? I thought, and, they, uh, I thought the court uh, put the kibosh on that one. Oh, man, I was looking forward to that happening. But anyway, or at least getting a score on the board because <laughs> I didn't think it was going to pass. But then you had uh, the state of Jefferson, Northern California, Southern Oregon, obviously Hawaii, Alaska, also very strong independence movements there. So I, I think there's a, a sort of shift with the awareness of the internet also that's very important in this. And I talk about specifically in the book, the internet effect. Mm -hmm. And it's that people who grew up with the internet, and I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry, you don't count. One generation. The internet grew one, up with me. He's, a few, he's, he's, he's got a couple of years on me. Uh, but no, I, and I barely count. I'm, I'm 36. So I grew up, I, I like to say that I grew up with the internet, not like I grew up and I had it from the beginning, but like with it, uh, that it was sort of an awareness that like I, I, I got to have a childhood without the internet. Mm -hmm. But uh, by the time I got to high school, it was a, a presence. And by the time I got to college, it was Facebook. It was very limited. I was like one of the colleges that had like the early access to Facebook. It was cool. Like back in 2004 or something. Um, but uh, it's a sort of lack of tolerance for problems that only exist for a lack of information. Like, why do we have yeah. to be tied into this bigger collective? It doesn't, like, why? And there's no good answer. And, and that's, that's an easier question. That's a way easier question for people to ask than do we need government at all? Do we need government at all sparks like, whoa, because we've got so much propagandized well, dependence, yeah. right? And most people are like they don't think of government the way that we as the analytical nerdy white male INTJ spamming for Ron Paul from our parents' basements like to think of it as you know we, we look at it as as this institution. They think of it as what's delivered to them. Mm -hmm. And it's roads, welfare, public services, theft and taxation. Oh that sucks. And it's bigger <laughs> than you think it is, but they make it look small. So like right. it, they they see and that's how most human beings are. And the fact that most of us like really just want to minimize the role of government in our lives, you know, a lot of us have like fucked that up really bad. If you're a libertarian and you want to minimize the role of government in your life, you spend all your time talking about government, you fucked up. Like, you know, you're doing something <laughs> wrong. Um, so I, that, that shift though in, in you know, I, 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 if you're on the cusp in between generations, right, you, you go with the younger one. So I'm a millennial. And, uh, <laughs> I think I think with the millennial generation, there's that critical shift in awareness. And it's, it's hard to ask, do we need government at all? It's easy to ask, why do we need to be in this shape of government, in this body, in this territory versus this? Okay. And the end result of, of that is always... Why can't we just be independent locally at the smallest unit possible right. where we can get what we want and make it work? So and then you go, that's, that, that's, that's where we want to go. Like that mm -hmm. gets us pretty much to voluntarism where you can have that at the local level and you can opt out on your own property at that the, point. Part of the problem is even terminology. Things do have to be governed. And right. we've co-opted the term for a political entity and says, well, if it has to be governed, yeah, they've the co-opted the term it. itself, right? Exactly. It's kind of messed up. Well, and, and it, this becomes like there's there's an interesting uh, semantics debate in in the movement whether we should call it government or the state. Mm -hmm. And I I certainly appreciate the argument for calling it the state, but I, I think most people still understand it as government. But it's like yeah, even that word has been co opted, and you have to point out if you call that government, we're not talking about corporate government. Well company government we're not talking about you know church government we're not talking about organizational government right. you know we're talking about the state we're talking about the what you besides, the, the mainstream the thing that you call the government besides it's a good evil word enemy of the state we don't yeah. say enemy of the government yeah because <laughs> governance is a good thing well, I it's and, and I, I could I could be convinced I, I think if if there's a shift in uh, the the mainstream semantics. I could be convinced to use the term the state more, uh, but when I did the analysis, I came down on the side of like people call it the government. It's only That's it's only fine. it's only assholes who are going to go. 
Well, really? Do you mean everything that's called? No, no we mean the government. Do we really? <laughs> right. No, we mean the. You know what I'm talking about? T, like the T. territorial <laughs> monopoly, the, the the flag, the the columns on the buildings, the the assholes in the suits, and the those that, that government. You know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah, that the government. Don't play games with me. But yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Well, let's let's move on to the idea of dissolving the government. <laughs> well, localizing, I say dissolve the federal, the platform of my presidential campaign is the peaceful, orderly, responsible dissolution of the federal government. And it's really very easy to, to, to explain to someone like how that's more practical on every level. Well, you've said in, in other at other talks, you, you've talked about the fact that when people object to you doing this executive order thing, that it won't really matter because, first of all, it's unconstitutional anyway, but that the public will have gotten to the point where they're going to accept it because that's what they want. That's what they elected you to do. Right. So this brings up the question, why bother to run for office? Why not just sign the executive order? Why not just talk to people about the need for it, sign it, and have the country execute it? Why go through the whole process of joining this political circus and having to compete in a game that's rigged against you in the first place. And even if you do defeat it, it seems like a lot of effort goes into that that could be better spent. Just sign the executive order and start implementing it. What do you mean by just start implementing it? Well, the executive order says you're going to set up a caretaker group, right? You're going to act as the caretaker. You well, resign no, no, as president. I, but, well, I would resign it. But the thing is, it doesn't work if there's still a president. Of course it does. Look at shadow governments. No, I'm talking about actually getting... So, but I mean, as if, 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 pop, on, if, on, if what you've done is shifted the popular mindset yeah. to accept okay, that okay, this is okay, so, okay, so I can address that directly then. <clears throat> um, as libertarians, what we want is... A voluntary society, a free society, which is essentially a society of universal nonviolence. Mm-hmm. The violence of the state happens by a critical mass of consent of the public. Okay. As de Tocqueville said in Democracy in America in 1831, in a democracy, the people will get the government they deserve. Mm-hmm. I think that's true in every form of government, no matter what you want to describe it as every system of power and control exists to a certain degree with the consent of its victims. Right. It has been shown over and over again in human history. Gandhi, MLK is the great prime examples that everybody in the United States is familiar with. Uh, have shown that when people withdraw their consent to a system of power, it is no longer sustainable. Mm-hmm. And you could go the route of agorism. And and I wholeheartedly support being agorist, Konkin's doctrine of conducting your economic affairs outside of the purview of the state, engaging deliberately in black market activity and barter and not paying taxes. But I can prove historically, mathematically, that that alone will never lead to the end of the state until you get over 95 plus percent of the population on board. In the first American presidential election, less than 2% of the public voted, white landowning males. And the government didn't say, oh, shucks, I guess we don't have a public mandate, we're just gonna go home. No, they said, screw you, we're the government. And we're in charge of this territory now. But they were, the 2% who voted were in fact the rulers. Well, hold on. It doesn't doesn't change my point here. So, if you got ninety five percent of the population to believe in voluntarism and to practice agorism, you would still have those five percent total assholes hiring one percent with the guns to point them at you and subject you to the to their whims of the state. The violence of the state happens by consent and it happens in today's expectations of what you have to do to get that consent is a certain amount of public consensus 
that's where we are as a society. We're not yet at the point of, no, it's market-based and it's totally voluntary. And if I want, don't want to play, I get to go home. And you can't force me into any relationship that's wrong. We're not there yet. We're still at the point of, well, if there's enough public consensus, we're going to force our will on you. And even if we weren't, we'd still be dependent on the systems. So the election provides us with the mechanism of building that consensus that you describe, of getting to that point of critical mass, because it's going to be way, way, way easier to convince 51% of the American electorate to vote to dissolve the federal government than to get 95 per plus percent of the American public actually effectively practicing agorism. If you do that, if you get 51% of the voters to go along with that, in a sense, because as you say, where the culture is, people have grown up with certain expectations. The expectation, correct, you know, whether it's, it's, it's good or bad, in many cases, is that the government will be there to provide certain services. For 22 million people, it's their bread and butter, the 7% yeah. of the public that work for the uh, American government. Aren't you then using the electoral process as a weapon to take that away from them? No, it's not a weapon. It's a peaceful mechanism of withdrawing the consent of the American public. But you're taking it away from them and not giving them a choice, an independent choice. Well, yes, I'm saying you can no longer steal from people to pay your salary. Even if they're not the ones doing the stealing. They've been brought up to think you this is a noble be, you thing. You cannot be, I, I, I am going to stop the theft. And that happens mm -hmm. day one uh, with this executive order. It is a declaration that the federal government is of no authority whatsoever. No federal laws are enforceable at all. And it's a declaration of bankruptcy. That okay. it is a bankrupt institution. And and the term I used for myself was uh, to th that I would withdraw from the presidency to become the custodian, custodian. of the federal government. Correct. And that my role would be uh, pretty much defined by that of a uh, executor of, of a bankruptcy of a of a bankruptcy agent or a, a trustee in that sense. So I've got the Libertarian Party platform here. So it's beautiful the internet. It's right? beautiful, and especially I, I, the first part. Okay, so I assume largely you're in accord with this. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I mean there might be a few things in there where I would prefer different wording. But, sure. Uh, I and I I don't want to say a blanket statement. I perfectly endorse the platform because it, it's been through. Uh, a lot of debates and revisions over the years, and it's a very uh, vibrant presentation of, of a lot of beautiful ideas. And, and I, I definitely uh, agree with the gist of it and, and the statement of principles is, is uh, I've considered getting it tattooed on my body. <laughs> okay. Well, and, 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 and I'm not the first one to think of that, actually. No. I give credit to uh, Karen Ann Harlos, who's a great Libertarian Party activist and historian and... Uh, has an almost, almost, but not quite unhealthy obsession with uh, the statement of principles in, in, in the history of the, the well, LP. One of the things that, it, it's got a lot of interesting things in here because most of the platform is favoring free market as opposed to government uh, action on things. But it does say the protection of individual rights is the only proper purpose of government. And it talks about the uh, maintaining the a military to defend the United States against aggression. Yeah, I would disagree with those parts then. You do disagree yeah. with those? Because I was going to ask where the money comes from to fund those things. Yeah, now some libertarians uh, who do agree with those things will make the case that there's a way for the government to do that voluntarily. And, and, and I would say, well, then it's not government and you're going to have a serious morph in the structure of government and those libertarians would say yeah that's what we want and so like i'm with them there um but yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't use those terms i mean I, and, I, and i i do really disagree uh i think the libertarian party and libertarians in general have uh been tempted by a certain kind of pandering and on on uh those issues of militarism and uh and and police uh there's been a certain, uh, it, at least verbal compromise that, that I really don't like. And I think, excuse me, as I said earlier, uh, it is really essential to freedom and the progress of the freedom movement to oppose militarism directly at its core. One of the things that... And I mean, you, you know that, you have that experience as a veteran and, right. and, and know that um, 
that it's just it's just silly. Like the the, the whole idea of of you know, dressing people up in silly costumes to kill each other, like, because, you know, richer people told them to, you know, right. it's poor men dying. You, you don't even pockets, have the need like, to know. Every time, like, like, <laughs> just how, when are we going to fucking learn? Right. And I, I, I think humanity is learning. I think we're at this, we're at a really cool point. Again, is, is you know, where we are in this, this arc of human progress and the general decline of, of violence. I think we're at this point where, we're like we're we're really coming to the tail end of of militarism. And there's there's no need for libertarians to pander on that issue at all. Most millennials, if I may speak for my generation, <laughs> um, you know, we we're we, like yeah, world without war. Why haven't we figured that out yet? We have the internet. We put we put someone on the moon, and we ha- we haven't figured out how to stop killing each other. Like like with governments, like well, really like now, as a writer, oh. I have to object. You'd be disrupting all the dystopian novels. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you also said though that in in your book, freedom, a country that is not militarized will make no enemies. Well, obviously that's speaking, and you, I know you raised some some sort of semantic quabbles. No, with, it's not semantic. That, but... It's it's the idea that. Enemies don't arise because you've alienated somebody. Sometimes it's just out of jealousy or wanting what you have. You know, Nepal, you could, you could argue they don't have enemies. They have people who want to exploit them. But I say they're enemies. Compared to the enemies that you create from fucking with other people through militarism and imperialism, the... Envy effect is not significant. Well, I'm, I'm not arguing. I'm not, I'm not, like I'm not arguing. It's because we're free. I mean, you're kind of getting on. I know you didn't say that, but you're, you're going in that direction. No, I'm by not. Saying I'm not. There's, what there's I'm a saying jealousy is, effect is. What I'm saying is countries have traditionally, historically, attacked other countries because of what they have. So that, well, that, well, that's. I'll say that's different. Rain, not, a no, 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 okay, so, it's changed yeah, so many times. Yeah, that's, that's, okay, that's, that, you're talking about like imperial theft, right? Well, government's fighting for a, a plot Stealing of land that they want. It has yeah. resources, yeah. Yeah. And they fight for that. Yeah, well, and they make enemies as a result. Of course they do. <laughs> but, but the country who has the land in the first place, it's not an issue of whether or not they have a military. In fact, if they don't have one, they're Okay, so then I'm going to get really happen. semantic on you and say, yeah, but it's the country with the military that's making shit happen. They're the one making the enemy well, situation true. in the first place. I'm, I'm not denying that. that. If and I would argue. So you're so you're saying that you're, you're you're including in your concept of make enemies the idea of being a victim. Yeah. Uh, and okay, fine. And uh, so your your argument saying that they're not militarized. No, this is perhaps more. So that's maybe, just not my use of the phrase here. Okay. That's all. You're you're talking about not going out and being the bully who who gets people wanting to take them down. Right. Right. Okay. That. But I I was just taking issue with the idea that it makes no enemies. I mean everybody. That's that's known makes enemies. People who have things make enemies. You ever watch these uh, murder mysteries? And it's always like, did he have any enemies? Well, of course. Yeah, he's no, no, no. I, and, yeah. So also, I, I suppose in, in, I'm using the word enemies in a, in a specific context okay. here. That it's like you know, you know, in, in a large scale resent. All right. That's just one clarification on that because that didn't strike me as a. So every most things in the book, you do a good job of explaining. What you're talking about, in a and then I throw sense. in some like big, and then I, and then I try to condense a chapter of of Mises into uh, a sentence, and it sometimes requires a little unpacking. Right, <laughs> that's all. Fair enough. Yeah, and uh, going back to the Libertarian Party, um, seems to be a couple of things going on. First of all, I've heard you say that most libertarians are basically anarchists the way you understand it is that well that raises a whole other semantic can of worms around the word anarchist but i would say that uh voluntarist really is the uniting because some people in this see so if you say anarchist is no government um and and i don't agree with that definition anarchist would say no coercive government Okay. Right, mm-hmm. you, can have all, you can have all the voluntary government you want, and it's still in line with anarchist principles. Mm-hmm. Because anarchists of, of all stripes, you know, generally wouldn't have a problem with that. But um, the, the 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 key principle of of voluntarism 
if you define government as something that could be voluntary, then you could be very pro-government and still be just as true to the philosophical principles. Okay. When it, it seems like in the last few years that the one thing that's happening to the Libertarian Party, unfortunately, is it's because it's gotten more viable, it's also become a, uh, uh, a place that people who are not of the straight Republican or Democratic parties are landing because there's more support there than in running as an independent. And it seems that a number of people that I see proclaim they're talking about trying to run as a libertarian don't seem to be libertarians at all. Some are yeah. individualists. Yeah. So this, John McAfee, yeah, well, this, yeah, well, no, McAfee is a libertarian now, and, and I know because he read my book and endorsed it publicly. Oh, okay. Um, and, and he really changed his messaging in 16 uh, after that point, and it was because he got Judd Weiss on his campaign and asked him to do that. But for the Libertarian Party, when you join the LP, you have to check a box that says, I oppose the initiation of force to achieve political or social goals. That's the, that's the Pledge of Voluntarism. That's the, mm -hmm. right there at its core. And so there's a struggle uh, it, sort of eternally within the Libertarian Party of should we be the home for everyone who's not a Republican or Democrat, or should we be the home for just people who adhere to exactly these principles and apply them in you know perfect consistency with the National Party platform? And obviously that's not going to work because the platform changes. Uh, but... Uh, we do have a, it's a good problem to have. Uh, but the challenge then is that you have people misrepresenting libertarianism. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather have that than nothing at all. So, Nobody there. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, you know, and, and, and as much as I, you know, it's funny because I get very much accused of being uh, an absolutist and, and very strict principled libertarian. And I have no problem with those labels whatsoever. <laughs> but I'm not. In, in any way uh, an exclusionist. I'm, I'm uh, I very much generally big tent. Anybody who says I'm a libertarian, I want to feel, I want them to feel included because it's really, it's in there in the word, libertarian. I believe in freedom. Mm -hmm. And if you're willing to say that, maybe you don't understand it. Maybe you haven't really considered how it applies to all these things. That's okay. I want you to be encouraged to be a better libertarian, to be more libertarian and to be embraced in, in a more inclusive concept of libertarianism. While I have my precise, I, I really have two definitions of, of libertarian that I use. Really? And, and one is someone who really understands it at the level of voluntarism, mm -hmm. believes in the ideal of a, a stateless society. And then two, you know, anybody who calls himself a libertarian. And this is kind of based on a Sam Konkin joke. Sam Konkin used to joke, he would say, there are two definitions of libertarianism. One, anybody who calls himself a libertarian. And two, anybody who agrees with me on absolutely everything. And that's, that's not even, I don't even agree with myself on everything. So I'm a bad libertarian. But uh, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, something to be said for actually embracing, I think, both of those ideas. That there, there, is, there is a strict definition of libertarianism that you can you can study and understand better and, and embrace that is based on absolute ethical, moral principles. But at the same time, you know, be inclusive, be encouraging, be positive, and, and, and that's fine. So I, I would say, maybe I, I, I sometimes use two different terms. I would say there's inclusive libertarianism and there's voluntarism libertarianism. Some people would call that big L, like, party, like big L libertarianism is in the Libertarian Party, capital L or small L libertarian is in principle philosophy. Okay. What, now you're big into the libertarian party. You're, you're uh, an activist who's trying to make change. What is your take on the people who are actively withdrawing? Whether they expatriate someplace, the people who want to build islands in the Pacific, and there's the synthetic island program. There are people who've tried to buy islands. There's in Europe, uh, I forget the name of the country now, um, that is being organized on libertarian principles. Liberland. Right. And these are all people who believe much as you do, except for the part about using the political action. 
they're doing more. But, as Ann Rand well, was suggesting, think, they've got their own golf. Well, hold, hold on. I've, I I know a lot of those people. I've met Vit Yedlika and, and uh, you know I know Roger Ver who's working on mm -hmm. some projects like that, and right. Jeff Berwick who does a lot of stuff on expatriating, and uh, they're all totally supportive of what I'm doing. They're not like okay. that's wrong and this is right. They're like we. we no, just... I was asking it the other way around. Your opinion of what they're doing. Right. Well, no. I mean, we just. I I think we just have. Uh, differences for our own preferences of where our efforts are best applied and i totally think that they are synergistic uh i would just make the case uh that that getting the political consensus whether it's political or not political whether it's you know i mean hey i could be totally wrong like i, I don't say this is how it's going to happen this is how the state's going to end but hey here's one possibility that's a lot easier than a collapse but it could be that we we shift the paradigm and and if we do, we're going to be using, someone is going to be using the platform that we get for free from the government because it's already been stolen from us to, to spread the message that you get, you know, a very efficient mechanism of doing so through the political process. That's going to be a part of it. And the, what I would say is the, the downside of, of what they're doing. I think, again, it's very important work. It's very positive. It's important and it's pioneering. But if you're living on a seastead, if, if, if all the libertarians in the United States go to Mexico and live on the tip of the Baja Peninsula <laughs> on a little, you know, gated expat community or, you know, move to uh, to Europe, then America's foreign policy is going to get worse and you're still going to be subjected to it. And what I mean is that the, we have an opportunity here to provide leadership and show the way forward not for people who want to be smarter and opt out because we see it we see what what's coming could be bad or we, we're pursuing a better life for ourselves but that we want to elevate all of humanity and and the fights here you know it, this is the source of the evil the the seat of the empire is washington dc and the people that control them <laughs> Yeah, who don't don't live in DC. <laughs> I, I I said very precisely the seat of the empire. <laughs> okay. Not the root of power, not not the people really in charge, but the seat of the empire at least. Very good. Well, that pretty much covered my questions, and I will encourage anybody who hasn't read it to get freedom and read it. Hold on, I gotta do what I do and it's free at thefreedomline.com in every digital format possible, including audiobook. All right. Did you narrate the audiobook? Yeah. Excellent. Well, arguably. But <laughs> most people, it's, it's listenable. You'll enjoy, you'll enjoy it. It's, <laughs> only, it's only three hours. All right. So, Adam? Thanks, Ed. Thanks very much. All right. Cool. Yep, still recording, no problem.